The House Transportation, Mobility, and Infrastructure Committee will come to order. Would the clerk please take attendance? Chair Shannon. Present. Representatives McDonald. Present. Coleman. Here. Conlon. Here. Farhat. Here. Fitzgerald. Here. Hoskins. Here. Miller. Here. Outman. Here. Roth. Here. Brooks. Present. Kuntz. Here. St. Germain. Here. Mr. Chair, you have all members present. You do have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, I need a motion to adopt the minutes from last meeting on October 3rd. Representative Conlon makes that motion. Seeing no opposition, the minutes are adopted. Uh, today on the agenda, we'll be voting out House Bill 4028 and then take testimony on House Bills 5103, 5056, and 5058. Uh, Senate Bill 87 is on the agenda, but we, we will uh, not be taking any action on that today at the request of the sponsor. Uh, to get things started, we will be taking the vote. First is HB 4028, and I do want to read in a card. Um, Ed Noyola from the County Roads Association supports the bill, does not wish to speak. And next we have Representative Outman offering us an H2 substitute. Uh, Representative, would you like to speak to the substitute? Yes, okay. re real briefly. Thank yep. you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Uh, members, basically the substitute would remove the blanket exception for wreckers towing a disabled vehicle and would instead uh, mirror that of public utility vehicles that fall under um, this guideline for restricted roads. Um, so under the H2 substitute, the wrecker would be exempt from the weight limits to remove an accident, impounded, or a disabled vehicle, and they would just have to simply notify the county if they believe they are overweight. Thank you, Representative. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt the substitute? Representative Roth makes that motion. Will the clerk please take a roll call vote? On the motion to adopt the H2 substitute, Chair Shannon? Yes. Representatives McDonald? Yes. Coleman? Yes. Conlin? Yes. Farhat? Yes. Fitzgerald? Yes. Hoskins? Yes. Miller? Yes. Altman? Yes. Roth? Yes. Brock? Yes. Yeah. Kuntz? Yes. St. Germain? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 13 yeas, 0 nays, 0 pass. The H2 is adopted. The substitute is adopted. Uh, next, I need a motion to report HB 4028 with recommendation as substituted. Uh, H2, Representative Kuntz makes that motion. Would the clerk please take a roll call vote? On the motion to report? Yes. Oops, Chair sorry. Shannon? I got ahead of myself, <laughs> yes. Representatives McDonald? Yes. Coleman? Yes. Conlin? Yes. Farhat? Yes. Fitzgerald? Yes. Hoskins? Yes. Miller? Yes. Altman? Yes. Roth? Yes. Brooke? Yay. Kuntz? Yes. St. Germain? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 13 yeas, 0 nays, 0 pass. House Bill 4028 is reported as substitute H2. House Bill 4028 is reported with recommendation as substitute H2. Up next, we have Representative McKinney, uh, and joining him will be Judge Meineke, here discussing HB 5103. Good morning, Judge, good, good morning, Judge, committee. Really, really oh, quick, Judge, yeah. remind us what uh, district court you're at. 44th district court. 40, 44th district court serving <clears throat> the communities of Royal Oak and Berkeley. Thank you so much, Representative McKinney. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Shannon and members of the House Committee on Transportation. Um, this is an important bill uh, in front of us, and I'm proud to say this is my first testimony um, on the bill and policy. I sit on appropriations, so I don't get to hang out with you guys in the policy committee realm as much. Um, but wanted to talk about our House Bill 5103. When I was elected, I promised my constituents that each and every day, I will work to improve their lives and to be their voice in Lansing, to represent them to the best of my ability and to listen to their concerns. Today, I'm fulfilling that promise. House Bill 5103 will help improve the lives of so many people, including many of my constituents and many of yours, that so often fall through the cracks of our justice system. Many of them are poor, and this bill gives them an opportunity for a better future and achieve independence and self-reliance. In my second month of office, a constituent from Detroit contacted my office. They went to the Secretary of State's office to take a driver's test, to get a driver's license uh, because they needed it for a job. After paying for the test from the limited means, my constituent passed the test but was told they were not able to get a driver's license. Why? Because of Section 303, subsection G, prohibited them from getting a driver's license for three years because they had two or more moving violations that occurred before the issuance of an original license. 
Mike's constituent had paid the associated fines and penalties for these previous moving violations and now was being penalized for doing the right thing and trying to get his license to drive legitimately. Like so many of my constituents and so many in all of our districts, because they are poor and with the lack of a comprehensive mass transit system in Detroit and the metro Detroit region, they chance driving without a license. They still can't afford their insurance. And because they get pulled over for a broken tail light or running a stop sign, they are issued tickets. It's the gamble so many in my community face and they don't realize that as it comes along with long-term consequences, such as a three-year ban or driving legally in Michigan. So what does, hap what does, so what does happen in these three years? Many still gamble driving without a license because they need to get to work. In my constituents' case, it is a loss of a job opportunity, an opportunity for him to get a CDL that a company will have paid for him to get, an opportunity for him to get a job that has great benefits and to provide for his family. Instead, he is trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. House Bill 5103 will remove this provision in the Michigan Vehicle Code. It will give people an opportunity to make many uh, Michigan citizens' lives better and help them achieve independence and self-reliance. It will stop excessively penalizing people for being poor, and I hope you will vote in favor of this bill with me to discuss the law and its implications um, in our communities in detail. I have Judge Meineke from the 44th District Court in Oakland County to provide perspective to why we need House Bill 5103. Judge Meineke, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Again, my name is uh, Derek Meineke. I'm the Chief Judge of the 44th District Court, serving the communities of Royal Oak and Berkeley. I would like to thank Chairperson uh, Shannon, Vice Chair McDonald, Vice Chair Outman, uh, and the entire committee for the opportunity to share with you my experiences from the bench as it relates to 257-303G and why House Bill 5103 is such a crucial piece of legislation for so many in our state. Let's first break down what 257-303G says. Actually, let's let's go back even further and just try to understand what is the purpose of 257-303 to begin with. Well, it's simply a statute that defines certain groups of individuals that are not allowed to obtain valid licenses in the state of Michigan. Included are groups such as those who cannot pass the written or road exams, a non-resident, someone who has a revoked or suspended license due to multiple drinking and driving offenses. Common sense and traffic safety would dictate that the Secretary of State should clearly not issue these groups a valid Michigan license. However, when you get down to subsection G, the statute creates another unique group. It reads, an individual who has been convicted of or received a juvenile disposition for or has been determined responsible for two or more moving violations under a law of this state, a local ordinance substantially corresponding to a law of this state, a law of another state substantially corresponding to a law of this state within the preceding three years if the violations occurred before the issuance of an original license to the person in this state, another state, or another country. It's 81 words long. And on its face, seems pretty innocent. Hey, if you've been driving without a license and picked up a traffic offense, well, we don't like that. So you can't get a license for a period of time. But an actual impact on the citizens of the state hoping to get a license, the law is draconian, malignant, it steals hope, and it keeps thousands of our fellow citizens in a virtual prison, unable to enjoy free and clear transportation on our roadways. Now, let me explain how I've become so acquainted with this law and its devastation. At our court, we have a one-of-a-kind program called Operation Drive. I've provided some information to the committee members here today. I, um, it's basically a program that assists individuals who have been charged with traffic misdemeanors to restore their licenses to become legal drivers. I took the bench in 2013, and at that time, we did our misdemeanor arraignments on Thursday afternoons. And as you can imagine, serving the communities of Berkeley and Royal Oak with major traffic arteries like 696, 75, and Woodward, our court sees a significant number of traffic misdemeanors. And it didn't take long for me to see a disturbing trend. 90% of the individuals who were sitting in my courtroom were African American. That seemed to me, an, to me to be an obvious problem. As I dug deeper, what was revealed was a systemic issue in our Metro Detroit region, and I later discovered a statewide reality of inequality in the area of transportation. That's why I'm so glad that this bill is in front of the Transportation Committee, because at the core, this is a transportation issue. Recognizing this, the 44th District Court staff and, and I decided we weren't going to be a part of the problem anymore. Uh, we're going to become part of the solution, and that's the origin, 
the genesis of our Operation Drive program. So basically what happens in the Operation Drive program, and you can um, you, you have a copy of the welcome letter that everybody in the program receives, but the goal is to um, educate the individual in front of us, give them encouragement, and also structure uh, to make sure that we follow through because a person graduates from our program only when they have a valid license. And we'll de delay the sentence as long as possible, and once they get that valid license, then we significantly reduce their fines and costs. Right now, since I, I, when I left the courthouse this morning, I actually checked our numbers. We have 520 people currently in our program. And since March of 2016, we have restored 1,480 licenses. These are individuals who came into our court without a valid license and now are validly licensed drivers. We don't look to do shortcuts here, all right? This is not a situation where we take a bad driver and get them on the roadway. We take individuals who are otherwise qualified to be drivers, educate them, get them the support, and get them on the road legally. Now, our, our program has had many successes, but we continue to run into this brick wall for some of our participants. They've paid off all their tickets, they've done everything we've told them to do, but yet when they go to the Secretary of State, they couldn't get their license. So um, early on in uh, around 2014, 2015, I talked to um, uh, Sylvia Mathis from our court, and she just recently retired and uh, always refused to take credit for this, but I would give her this credit. She was determined to find out why this was, and so she contacted, contacted our Secretary of State Liaison, and sure enough, that we were educated about this 257-303G. So this has been on my radar for nine years, and it is um, such an uh, encouraging moment that we're even having this discussion today. Um, because the reality, what 303G does to a person. So let me just give you some examples. Let's take John Smith. So John Smith has a license, drives recklessly, and puts people in danger. Reckless driving, he's convicted, he gets a 90-day hard suspension of his license. John Smith has a license, drives under the influence, gets a charge of operating while intoxicated. That's a 30-day hard suspension. John Smith has a license, Drives under the influence for a second time. That's operating while intoxicated, second offense. That's a one-year revocation, but can apply to have their license restored after that year. Then consider this reality. John Smith has never had a license, but drives anyway, and at some point picks up two moving violations. Let's say no license on person and no proof of insurance. He pays them. And the charges hit his record on August 1st, 2023. Thanks to 303G, he is then ineligible to receive a license until August 1st of 2026, three years. There is no recourse, no restricted license. He has to sit and wait. Or he could do, as one uh, Secretary of State branch employee told me, she says to people in this situation, establish residency in Ohio and get your license there. Because in any other state, they could move because they, the other states will check and see if there's a suspension or a revocation in Michigan. But as long as those things aren't present, they could absolutely get a, state, a license in the state of Ohio. And the reason I, I, I know this for certain is because I've had a number of people in my program get licenses in Missouri. And most recently, um, we had a 303G individual that we were working with who had to move to Arizona. And we just celebrated her license. But this is someone of talent and opportunity. She's in a nursing program there. This is a person who, who should be um, employing her talents here in the state of Michigan. And she's now in Arizona. She has a valid license, but she's in Arizona. Now, I think what, um, when I describe to people this law, their first impulse usually is, one, I didn't know about it, and two, how is this the law? Um, and I have really no good explanation, but my hope is to generate action, because when someone actually finds out about this law, when a person who's going to be impacted by this law, when they actually find out about it, it's at the moment that they're closest to getting their license. They've paid off their tickets. They show up at a Secretary of State branch. They believe that they are eligible. Everything suggests that they are. They go in, oftentimes they're even able to take the written test. I've had a number of individuals who have actually taken the test, passed the test, and at that moment been uh, uh, informed, well, you can't get a license because these two tickets have to come off your record. So you can come back in 2025 or 2026. And as you can imagine, it is devastating. It is just the same as pulling the chair out from someone who's about to sit down. Uh, it is the ultimate hope stealer. Now, how it affects my program? Uh, obviously, when I'm confronted with this situation, we're trying to figure out ways under the law to, to see if we can still help this person. 
So what it would require us to do, and, and, and our att uh, attorneys who are fantastic, and our, um, our MIDC attorneys who, are, uh, who do the work in our program, they're amazing. They work with our individuals, they inform them, and if need be, they'll go to another court because we have to get that prior charge that's holding them up, we have to get that set aside or changed. So it depends how welcome the court is that we're going to, because it's a different court, it's not ours, how welcome the prosecutor is. And there's one thing that judges and prosecutors you know, don't care for much, and that's reopening closed files, because they're already busy enough as it is. And so we have had some success with that. So we will, we, you know, I, I, we have, uh, I have Elizabeth Chappelle here with us. She's, she recently went to Gross Point and was able to have a successful um, uh, setting aside of a, a, a conviction. But, but think about that. It requires a judge and a specialty program and an MIDC attorney filing a motion in a separate court to get one charge overturned. And that type of energy and effort when you compare the reality of the person that's before us, this is not a dangerous driver. This, this House bill does not put dangerous drivers back on the road. It just makes sure that an individual who should have an opportunity to get a license, should have an opportunity to actually take the written test, road test, that they receive that opportunity. That's all. Now, you may wonder how many people does this actually affect? Um, are these just sort of unicorn examples that I'm pulling out of thin air or cobbling together to make it seem that much more important that we deal with this? So remember, I said 520 people that are currently in my program. And we do a regular check on our dockets about how many uh, individuals are affected. In fact, there are so many, we create a stamp that we put on a file that says 303G so that we can notify our staff right away that this is something that's going to re require extra attention and notice and work. But as we do our checks, about 20 to 25 percent of our population um, at any one time, for example, a recent docket had 10 out of the 39 people set for court that day, so about 25 percent are affected by this. So if we have 520 people in our program, even assuming 23 percent, that's 120 people. 120 people that would instantly have their lives changed by this law. Now, recognize that I'm one district court. There are 103 district courts. There are 103 district courts. And that's only dealing with the individuals affected by 303G that are actually in, 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 in courthouses. There are also thousands of others that haven't come into the courthouse building. So the change in this law um, would make a substantial difference in the lives of so many. Now, I, I do believe that Precious Kelly, who happens to be in our program, is here and is, I, I think is going to offer testimony today. Um, but uh, I, I think of a number of different uh, examples. But one that really struck me is I had two individuals, an individual named Craig and an individual named Dan. Now, Craig worked through the Street Democracy Program that the 36th District Court also had a case with us. And at the conclusion of the Street D Democracy Program that he worked through, now, he had had a number of traffic offenses. They were all dated, you know, 10, 15 years old. But at the conclusion of paying off his tickets, doing everything he was supposed to, he received a, a bargain, a deal, a plea deal down from whatever traffic misdemeanors he had to no operator's license on person. Okay? Now, no operator's license on person, that's a zero-point offense. That's, that's a steal. That's a, someone's going to think, that's a great deal. So he completed the street democracy program. He, got, get, he received the reduction and then went to the Secretary of State, and they, they said, wait a minute here. They all hit your record the day you pled. Because that's the other sort of sneaky secret about this is that if you have an outstanding traffic misdemeanor and you haven't gone to court, again, we don't celebrate that, but they haven't gone to court. I just think about, I think about Dan on this one. So Dan did everything I told him to do. He went and paid off all of his traffic misdemeanors. His traffic misdemeanors were from 2011. He received a reduction for them. All right, who wouldn't take the reduction? He would have been better to take to plea it on the nose, but he, he took the reduction. It hit his record in 2022 and was told then he couldn't get a license until 2025 after he did everything we told him to do, everything we would want a person to do. He did it all and then was told he couldn't get a license for three years. I can think of no compelling state interest in this language remaining part of our driving laws. We want people to get their license, and yet we have statutory language that makes it nearly impossible if they've committed any minor traffic offenses prior to applying. This bill does not make it easier for dangerous drivers to get a license. 
It doesn't make it so someone who's revoked can get an easier path. Someone who's suspended will not get an easier path. All it does is make sure that there's this unnecessary, unfair, unjust barrier is removed. They still have to take a written test. They still have to take a road test like anybody else. Now, in addition to the people that I'm thinking about that it will help right now, I also focus on the, the countless numbers of individuals yet to come as long as this law remains part of our um, statutory language, as long as it remains part of our reality, we have no idea the number of, of, of individuals that will continue to harm. For example, let's just say that a young man enters into a courtroom today and he's charged with uh, no license, never having applied for one, and um, a, tra a disobey traffic control device, like stop sign ticket, okay? He walks into a court. The prosecutor doesn't know about 303G. His defense attorney doesn't know about 303G. The prosecutor offers what looks like a great deal. We'll reduce it down to a one-point offense, all right? But none of them have looked at his driving record and realized he had another traffic stop for a no-proof insurance ticket. And now this young man is he's walking out of the courthouse thinking he's had a great deal. He's walking out of the courthouse with a three-year ban. Now again, I am not cobbling together examples just to drive home the point. That young man was in my court yesterday. That young man named Xavier was in my court yesterday. Now thankfully, our prosecutor knows about the law. Our defense attorneys know about the law. So he received a reduction to a, uh, a non-abstractable offense. He still has one within three years. So I placed him in my Operation Drive program. I gave him all the information about making an appointment, you know, getting himself prepared for the written and road tests. But if he picks up one more traffic ticket, it doesn't matter what it is. This 18-year-old young man will be barred, and he won't be able to get a license until after his 21st birthday. So I want to thank you all for your time, your attention, and um, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you may have about this. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Judge. Um, very noble cause. Uh, we will have some questions here, and I, I thank you for recognizing uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Chappelle. I know she plays a big role in this program, so thank you for joining us today also. Um, so we do have some, a few questions here. Uh, Representative Outman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Representative, for being here to testify on your bill. Thank you, Judge, as well. Uh, and while I believe the intent of this bill is good, um, th there are some moving violations that are more serious than others. And I know you uh, mentioned some of the, the minor ones, but given that the Secretary of State suspends an indiv individual's license if they have 12 or more points, I think within a two-year period, um, would someone be able to res receive their license under this bill if they committed multiple offenses that would total 11 points? Uh, I'll give you a couple examples here. Like, Fleeing and eluding an officer, that's six points. Uh, speeding greater than 15 miles per hour over the limit in a work zone, that's five points. Would they still be eligible to receive their license giving those moving violations? Well, the fleeing and eluding, no. That's going to carry with it an automatic suspension. So fleeing and eluding, you're, you're going to be suspended for that offense no matter what. I don't know. the. It depends on the level of fleeing and eluding that gets charged, but a fleeing and eluding for certain is going to generate a suspension. Um, uh, as far as... You know, the multiple traffic offenses getting up to the uh, 11 points that uh, I guess um, in those circumstances it would then come down to uh, I would imagine the Secretary of State will have to you know do, when someone gets up to 11 points they don't just there's no it's not that they don't have a warning that they are running afoul of the um, 12 point barrier I mean they're advised of these things um, and so in those circumstances a, a person could in theory get a license but then be subject to all the same warnings as anybody else. So it's, it basically is putting them on the same footing as, as anybody else with uh, 11 points that just happens to have a license. Um, but at the same point in time, I guess the only thing that I can mention is I've been, I mean, I've been, I've been doing this program for uh, um, nine years now, and the example that you provided, Representative, I've, I've never seen it. I've never seen an 11 point um, circumstance. Um, it would be um, you know, most of the people that I deal with, these are financial based circumstances. Someone gets pulled over, they don't have a license and they'll get multiple tickets, but usually they're no proof insurance, no registration, um, defective equipment. These are um, overwhelmingly 
financial-based sanctions, status-based sanctions. I understand, and, and you listed a, a ton of you know minor violations, but there are some moving violations that are you know much more serious than others, and this would you know exempt all of those essentially. No, I, so remember the most serious violations that we've talked about: reckless driving that still carries a 90-day suspension. This doesn't change that. Okay. All right, drinking and driving. That still carries with a 30-day suspension with restrictions. That doesn't change that. All right, um, you know there there are a host of other offenses like you, you mentioned fleeing and looting. That carries a mandatory suspension. So the type of the dangerous behavior um, that we're talking about, um, those are all going to carry suspensions. And this doesn't help somebody in that situation. And really, is not someone who we you know we work with a ton in our program because our goal isn't to get dangerous drivers an easier path to get on the roadway. It's to get people who would otherwise be capable and competent drivers. And this is just a simply an unnecessary barrier. Yeah, I understand. I just, <clears throat> striking the entire language without targeting specific moving violations just raises a few concerns, but I appreciate you clarifying some of that for me. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that. I understand, um, you know, your point, um, MBC. Um, I just hope that we don't let one, you know, hypothetical bad apple you know, ruin the whole bunch of what we're trying to do here today. It's a very important, it's a very important uh, uh, issue. Yes. And just to address uh, Vice Chair Altman's um, question, this only eliminates Section G. So everything that the judge talked about is staying the same. Everything else in our Michigan Vehicle Code stays the same. All it does is just eliminates the three-year barrier. Um, once those tickets and, and those fines are paid, once those actions are adjudicated, uh, it just eliminates because it's an added barrier. And what we're trying to do and what this legislation is going to do is eliminate the barrier um, from folks petitioning the state to receive their license. Yeah. Um, Representative Roth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative, thank you. And judge, also, <clears throat> any breakdown on age? I mean, is this 20%? under 18, 80% over 18, do you have any kind of age breakdown on I, you know, this I, group? I, I, I don't. Uh, I would say um, categorizing just as a under 25 issue or under 30 issue, um, it really does not um, say, for example, that there was some language that would, would um, restrict this to only individuals who are over 30 or, I mean, I'm just thinking of Sheila that I'm working with right now, she's 60. She's never had a license, um, and I'm only using first names here. But Kim, she, um, she she was 53 years old, got her license, and then went out and got a CDL after that. I mean, that's that's the other side benefit of this is that the individuals in our program, once they get a license, guess what happens? Then they get a, they register their vehicles, which we want. Then they get insurance, which is what we want. Then they actually able to get the employment. Uh, and so what I've seen, it really affects all ages. It's not just an under 25 issue or something that our, you know, our, our younger people are just not getting, getting on their horse and getting their license. It really is something where, and in particular, when you contemplate what's happened in the state when it came to licensing over the last 20 years, you got to remember there's a group, group, group of people that were affected by driver responsibility fees, all right, that were lost in the woods for an extended period of time. And then you had another group of people that when this body um, so wisely made the adjustments in 2021 uh, to make only certain offenses eligible for suspension. Prior to that, there were people who had, you know, 25, 30 suspensions for offenses like no registration. So I do have young people, like I said, Xavier yesterday, all right, but I also have individuals who are in their 50s and 60s who just, you know, who, sh who should have been driving all along legally, but just were negatively inf affected by previous legislation. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bruck. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Rep. McKinney. And, and Judge, thank you for your passion. I uh, definitely can tell that you're very knowledgeable and passionate about this issue. And a couple of my questions already got asked. I, I guess just to clarify, this is for individuals that have never had a license or if they had their license and it lapsed or something as well. See, now that's – and that's a – that's a great point to bring up because it really, the, the way the law is written, it only affects people who are unlicensed. So you can have somebody who's had a license before and picks up, for example, using uh, Representative Altman's example, picks up 11 points, all right, and they've had a license before, so this law doesn't affect them. And in this particular circumstance, um, just simply by being unlicensed and having two or more moving violations, um, they can't get one. That's it. That's, it's just the status of being unlicensed. And that's why if you go to another state, you can get one, just not here. 
So e- even just to clarify that, so even if I just didn't renew my license or an individual didn't renew their license, it lapsed. You're fine. They wouldn't, this one, Section uh, G, 303G would not apply to them. So it's just individuals that have never received a license. That's correct. That's you, your analysis is dead on correct. It would, if someone ran their driving record, it would say expired at the top, and they mm-hmm. would have to renew their license. But what, when, we, when our red flags go off is when we run a driving record and it says valid state ID, then I know that person's never had a license. So then I know 303G is triggered, and we've got work to do. Okay. Roger. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative. And I, you think you're, I think you're pinpointing the kind of insanity around this section of the vehicle code. So, um, Representative Conlon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rep. McKinney. And thank you, Judge, for being here for the very important legislation. <clears throat> I just have one question, which is beyond the fact that this is obviously a transportation issue, which we know is a problem in our um, urban areas and, and just generally, what part of it is also like a lack of student driving classes. I mean, I feel like it used to be that, you know, you because ha- to get a license, you have to do these classes, and they cost money. So I know it's a n- whole other issue, but just a quick background. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm hoping that someday, someday I'll be back here in front of this committee talking about um, driver's education. So... What was interesting is a couple of years ago, we had a, an intern that came through the court from Notre Dame Law School that w- became aware of th- um, 303G, and she actually had a law review article that was published on this law, but digging even deeper and, and recognizing that, you know, once we, once we started graduated licensing, all right, which required that step one, step two, segment one, segment two, all right, which got basically led to us having... Um, I would say more educated, prepared drivers, but less of them. Because uh, if you go to the Secretary of State website, at least I did so in the last six months, if you're looking for funds to support payment for segment one, segment two, you know, there was actually a link that said there is no, since 2004, there's been no funding for education. So if you get a you know, low-income house and um, you say to a 16-year-old, we need you to take segment one, take segment two. You know, it's going to be about $500, $600 total. Now, that was something that I was able to do for my children, but not every household can do that. And then they have to drive 50 hours. Well, that means that that vehicle has to have, I mean, that house has to have a working vehicle that's insured and a valid driver in the household that can drive with them. And so it has led to a gap in what I would say opportunity to become a a valid driver um, for our teenagers. And so I would hope that there would be some, at some point in time, a greater conversation. You know, once we take care of this, that there's a greater conversation, right? What, what more can we do? You know, we are, we're home to the Motor City. We are always going to be a state that, that, you know, wants to have people on the roadway enjoying their, their motor vehicles. What more can we do to make sure that not only are um, our individuals that, that uh, are eligible to take segment one, segment two, not only are we making sure that they go through that process, but that more individuals have access to that process. Because the reality that I see, and I've been seeing it for an extended period of time now, you get a a 16-year-old in a low-income area, and they they don't have the ability to get a segment one, segment two. So at 18, they become eligible, all right? Well, by 18, they've probably been driving already. And if they get pulled over in a certain location, they'll get a ticket, but then get sent on their way, all right? So it sends a message that this isn't a big deal. But then they go to a different community, a different place where it is a big deal. And now all of a sudden that same offense is causing them to be jailed for 60 to 90 days. This is the reality that I've been seeing for the last nine years that I've been working specifically on this. And so, yes, there are huge gaps that still remain. But this, boy, this, this would open the door to the right individuals, the people who want to get their license the right way, the legal way, the valid way. This is what this leg- legislation does. Thank you uh, for that. Um, and, you know, f- why we took driver's training out of schools, I well, it's beyond me. I mean, you're bringing up that issue. It's a separate, separate issue. But um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, but we do still have several people that would like to do give testimony. Uh, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you all for your time. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank, thank, thank you. you. So up next, we will have um, 
Aaron Shore from the Secretary of State, Melissa Horst, and Precious Kelly is coming up. Is that correct, Ms. Shore? She's coming up at the, okay. And Melissa, it's, it is Horst, right? Yes, Okay. Got it right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee members. I, I always say it's good to be in front of a committee when I get there, but as you've heard, this is a particularly exciting day, an exciting issue to be in front of you to right this wrong. Um, as you can imagine, our branch employees with the Department of State have been hearing this story for years, if not decades. Um, but we started hearing it more after the legislature passed the Clean Slate to Drive laws in 2020. And as you heard about earlier in the spring when the secretary testified in front of you, the department began to host a series of road to restoration clinics to help people get that license back. Um, as you know, the free clinics take place at locations across the state and connect residents with attorneys um, and even cover some of the fines and fees in locations. But we have certainly identified that other barriers exist, including this law is one of the ones that have come up in, in significant ways. We have right now in our system about 1,800 individuals that have a notation for 3031G on their driving record, and it shows us the date that they would be eligible for a license. We know that's a wild under-reporting of how many people in the state are affected by this law because that only likely includes people who have come to the department seeking a license. Um, I do want to speak to a couple of the questions that have come up. Rep. Outman, when we have someone who's an unlicensed driver, the department does still essentially create a driving record for them, and all of those points, all of the penalties will show up on the system. So not only is driving without a license a misdemeanor offense even on the first time and it steps up for a second offense, but all of those other points that would be assessed as if you have a license, those still show up. So if we have someone who is an unsafe driver, they're still going to be barred from driving just because of what's been on their record for a period of time. Um, and I think Rep. Conlon as well hit the, the nail on the head. So often the story that we've heard at our clinics is this might even start when someone's living at home and a parent asks them to run to the store quickly because they are in one of those communities where it's not treated as a big deal often. Um, and the parent should know, but we put a teenager who's unlicensed in the position of having to listen to their parent or break the law. And that can be a real challenge. And, and looking at the data that we have seen on driver education, because we are working on a proposal to bring to all of you, there are significant disparities. We only have roughly 55% of people under age 18 in Michigan that get a license. Um, we know that there are wild disparities by family income, and we know there are wild disparities by race. And in many areas of the state, particularly the northern portion of the state, even if you can afford it, there are not enough providers with the current system. You might be waiting a year or more to get access to a driver's education course. Um, so we will be bringing a proposal in front of you. The secretary is very excited about that conversation, about what role can schools play, what can we do. I don't want to lie. It's going to take money. Um, because that's what we took away that was in place that allowed most of us to go through driver's ed without having to pay for it like we do now. Um, what have I not touched on? I, we really appreciate um, all of you for considering this and, and thank Representative McKinney for bringing it forward. I think Judge Meineke hit on most of my points already. Um, but I'm, why don't we hear from Precious and then we're happy to take any questions that you might have. Well... Hello, and thanks for having me here. Um, I'm just basically here basically to tell my testimony, how it affected me, and it really has a lot. Like, I'm one of the people where I did have tickets before 18, and uneducated that once I turned 18, I was thinking like when I turned 18, they would get throughout, but no, it costs way more, and getting tickets more, not knowing about the law and and did not know until I did try to get my license. So even before I was educated, not even knowing and still getting tickets, how the date would just keep getting pushed back, keep getting pushed back. And then it got to a point where I was tired of going to jail. I was tired of getting my car impound. It was a time where I either had, I had to wear two ankle monitors for traffic tickets. Um, just a whole lot coming out of money. And it got to a point where um, I got a ticket, and I was just like, I'm going to pay him. I'm going to do what I got to do. I was turning 25. I'm like, I'm going to finally get my license. I paid, like, over $10,000 in different counties and cities. And 
went to the to the Secretary of State, took my test the first time ever, taking my test, I passed, got to the clerk, and she was like, you can't take it. And even then, I did not know about the law until I went to court, and that's when Judge Monique told me that it was a law called the 303G, and if you keep getting tickets, it's going to keep getting pushed back. So now I'm at a standstill where I cannot get my license until 26. I'll be 30 just getting my license. So... If this law does change, it will help. And it's crazy because a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't know about it. So some people are like me before where they would get tickets and they would still take the risk like, well, we don't care. We're just going to keep driving, keep getting tickets. But some people don't even know, like, driving without the license or the insurance and whatever all the other tickets that falls under the law that – each ticket they get, it gets pushed back three years. So even if you do take care of all your tickets and do everything that you need to do and then you get excited and you go and it's just like, you got to wait. You got to wait. It's nothing that you can do. And that that's what had happened to me. And I was thinking, like, because all the Secretary of State had told me, they didn't even tell me that it was a law. So I still wasn't educated then on a law, and I still was driving. Luckily, I didn't get a ticket and I had to go to court on an old ticket with Judge Monique, and he told me about the law because I still would have been driving and probably gotten more tickets because who's to say, you know, getting pulled over without having a license, that's a hard chance to take. And I, I did it for years, so I know. And every time I would get pulled over, I would go to jail. I would get more tickets, and not knowing the date would get pushed back more or my car would get impounded, so... I'm happy that to hear that something's in the work for it to get changed or hopefully to get changed. And even now, like sitting here now, learning more things about it and being educated on it. Because like I said, I did not know anything about it. So I'm glad that I know about it now. And I know not to drive anymore and know not to receive any more tickets or I'm going to have to wait three more years from 2025 to even get my license. Thank you so much for uh, giving us your testimony today and your experience with this, uh, with this law. Um, I'm hoping that we will uh, continue the conversation today and then bring it up for a vote maybe next week. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, I think we're going to hopefully solve this problem. So uh, do we have any questions for the Secretary of State or no questions? Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Precious. Um, so I have, I think, five different people wishing to speak briefly, uh, and you, but you're all from the same organization. Did you all want to come up right at the same time, or did you want me to call you individually? It's, com it's up to you. Yeah, Indi individually? At the same time. Okay, yep. So we have uh, Bryant Gary from Change, uh, Change Michigan Works. What is it? What's the, I'm sorry, what's the organization called? Change Me. Oh, Change Me. Okay. So, the, so I have Bryant Gary, uh, Andrew Smith. These are all from Change Me. Uh, Andrew Smith, Kenneth and Kennethy Dandridge, uh, Alana Pickens, and Monique Pickens. So, if you all would like to join us here at the table. The floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ken Dandridge. Uh, I'm the president and founder of Change Me Works. Uh, we've been helping people uh, navigate suspended driver's license uh, matters for over 10 years uh, ago is when we actually first encountered the, the issue with, uh, you know, the application denial. Uh, we help people as liaisons, people who really can't necessarily, you know, afford long-term uh, uh, legal fees or what have you. Uh, and so... Over the last 19 years, uh, we've helped uh, over 8,000 people uh, navigate the suspended driver's license matter, whether it be, you know, them not being able to uh, call courts during work hours or they may not feel comfortable going in and pay tickets. These are some of the services that we provide to help people to get their license restored while they are at work. Uh, and so 
you know, I'm really ecstatic to be here today to even have this conversation uh, because we have so many people that come through our program. I would say, what would you say, about 15 to 20 people a month, application denied? If not more. Yeah, that 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 call our that call us and, and we can't help them at all. And you know, I know we kind of pressured for time, but what I wanted to do is really just uh, share a quick story of a young lady that came in into our office some years ago. Her name was Latoya, um, and the the one thing that's not really being talked about is application denial. Uh, it is creating a homeless population, you know. Um, and so, so I'll, I'll kind of give you her story. Uh, I had a young woman come into my office. She paid over $7,000 in tickets with her income tax money. Prior to hearing about our program, likely the most money she would have uh, throughout the course of the year. She soon became a victim, victim of application denial. After paying all of the tickets, she was not eligible for a license for three years. She was notified by an SOS employee in a local branch that she had been impacted by application denial after being able to take the written test, okay? Uh, she then went uh, to the state, excuse me, uh, she, she then went on to say how devastated she was and she kind of acted out in the Secretary of State and the point that I want to bring uh, in this scenario is it, it really makes an unsafe environment uh, for SOS employees. You know, when somebody has paid seven or eight thousand dollars in tickets, and you have to be the person to let them know that they're not getting their license that day. Uh, but uh, application denial. Uh, so after hearing the news, she had to make a decision. Uh, she did not feel safe riding on public transportation. Uber and Lyft was just not an option financially. She made the decision to drive as an unlicensed driver. We know, of course, this was not the best decision. Within a year's time, she had racked up over $2,500 in tickets all over again, was arrested on her way to work, and she was given 90 days in jail. She lost her job immediately due to the point system at work. She was serving the eviction notice, which, of course, she couldn't respond from jail. So, therefore, she was evicted from her apartment. Her car was impounded on the day of the arrest, later repossessed from, of course, the lender, you know, forcing her into potentially having to file bankruptcy. Uh, you know, I, I would love for this young lady to have been here with us, uh, but unfortunately, she passed away. Uh, shortly after leaving our office. Um, so what I want to say is, like, I know we don't have the chance to help her, uh, but with changing this law, we will have the opportunity to help a, a, a lot of people. Did anybody else want to make any comments? Hi. Yes, sir. I'm Brian Gary, and I am Mr. Dandridge's assistant. And the shocking thing for me uh, that I found with application in denial is how no one at the Secretary of State can communicate, explain, before I go and pay nine, ten, seven thousand dollars worth of tickets. That money could have went towards my family, my children, whatever bills. But no one can give a thorough act. You go to 10 different secretaries of state, you're getting 10 different answers. And that's, that's not right. That's incompetence on a certain level, in my opinion. Well, I will say that the Secretary of State is here today in support of this, uh, this legislation. Um, so some, some of the issues that we've seen in the past hopefully will be solved with uh, getting this taken care of. Um, yes, sir. Hello, how's everybody doing? All right. So hello, my name is Andrew Smith, uh, and I'm here speaking on the matter of application denial. Application denial limitations to me is another law that is a heart that has harsh punishments for working adults, not even just in Michigan, but anywhere in the United States. The restrictions from 303G is illogical and absurd. And since myself and many people that I've that have been affected by this quiet law that no one knows about until it actually happened to you. I've been an advocate 
to get this thing amended. There's a saying that reads, put your money where your mouth is. As I interpret it, it meant that if you were actually serious, then simply investing your own money would prove your commitment. There's no better way to say that you're serious than putting your hard-earned money up. That's what separates the doers from the sayers. So after paying about $4,000 in tickets plus the responsibility fees at the time, which equated to about $8,000, I was also struck with application denial which said that if I that because I paid my tickets without challenging them, that was me admitting guilt. And because I admitted guilt, I would then be on a three-year suspension with not being able to apply for a license, which I had never had, and was affected by a law I had never even heard about in the first place. At the time, as a father of two young boys, it is merely impossible to be able to navigate to and from work to grocery stores, doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, schools, etc., all without being able to drive. Just when you decide that you were ready to get your license and be responsible, you went and paid your money to prove your commitment. You put your money where your mouth was just to be denied to be even able to apply again. If we're going to impose the driver's license on the residents of Michigan, then the common goal should be promoting more, more people to get the license instead of setting egregious penalties that will hinder people more than it will help them. Bringing more licenses to the state will increase our employment rate, bring more people into the businesses because now they're able to travel, and reduce the crime rate since driving while license suspended has been listed as a crime. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to make some comments? Okay. Yeah, the red one. There you go. Okay, thank you. Good morning, House. My name is Monique Dandridge, and I am the director of Change Me Works. Today I am here in support of Changing Law 5103. Change Me Works very hard to be liaisons and helping to restore a license with traffic matters by providing the community with updated laws and helping devise a plan to getting their license restored. <coughs> we have about a 90% success rate. We are here today to emphasize the fact that this law in the long haul promotes a complete negative perpetual cycle. Even after they have made changes and taken responsibility, which he just stated, they are still caught in the web where they now have to be suspended for an additional three years. I've heard so many stories just in the background alone listening and seen so many tears and how families are pained behind this law, but more so pained with not having knowledge of it but after paying fines, um, learning about it, and paying off the fines, there needs to be change that helps promote supporting the people versus putting up more building blocks in front of them to be successful. Change Me tries to do this in many ways by hosting informational events via Instagram groups of over 10,000 followers to get the word out. We know that by changing the law, it will boost young and old drivers into a position to better themselves. The opportunities are not equitable for those in areas like Detroit public school areas, like in Grand Blanc public schools. We have children in both, where they provide drivers training in certain cities and not in others, as we stated earlier. You may not think that this matters, but it does. We will continue to get the word out and work towards change. In closing, I represent the face of thousands you will never see. I represent the thousands you will never hear. I am the final product of Detroit and Farmington Public Schools, and I am living proof that broken crayons steal color. We ask you today, change your mind, change our story. The power is in your hands to change application denial today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you like to make some comments? Yeah. The floor is yours. Hello, my name is Alana Pickens, and I want to say that I support change in law 5103. Application denial is creating a homeless population, and this is dear to my heart because <coughs> my purpose is to create hope, help, <coughs> and healing to my community. In closing, I represent the face of thousands of children affected by this law you will never see. I represent the voice of thousands you will never hear. I am a work in progress in Grand Blanc, and and Flint Public Schools. I am living proof that broken crayons still color. I ask you today to change your mind to change our story. The power is in your hands to change, to change application denial today. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your testimony today. Yes, go ahead. Yep. 
Yes. I did want to recognize the Secretary of State. Uh, prior to COVID, we know uh, that the lines were like outrageous when it came to servicing, but uh, due to the uh, get in line uh, appointments, uh, that's been very efficient in helping uh, clerks spend more time with, with people individually. Uh, of course, the self-service stations, that's been a great deal. And then also uh, the road to restoration clinic. So I think uh, we are moving in the right direction in regards to giving people uh, the more one-on-one -on -one services uh, that they need as opposed to our old system where people were kind of just trying to get you know, get people through a line. So I did want to recognize Secretary of State for that. Well, thank you for that, and I'm sure they love hearing it. Uh, I, so thank you, everyone, for your testimony. Did Are you okay with uh, taking some – I will have one person that would like to take uh, ask a question. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Representative Coons. And I do apologize. This, this may have been a better question for the Secretary of State, but I didn't think of it then, so I'm going to think of it now. Regardless of 303G, the fines don't – you still have to pay the fines. If 303G, thank you both. Right. Thank you all. Right. Okay. Absolutely. That was my question. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming today. We really do appreciate you taking the time for testimony. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I do, do have one card to read in. Judge Kim Wiegand, uh, Michigan, she's from the Michigan District J Judges Association, supports a bill and does not wish to speak. Okay, so like I said before, uh, this will be a, a we're not going to be voting on it today. We'll take it up next week for a vote and then hopefully get that process moving uh, as quickly as possible.